Now, but, but von Neumann, von Neumann didn't, didn't prove this result, but he knew about it. He was curious what way you do it. The projections don't come in. The projections don't come in. What happens then? And that leads to the, you know, something called the von Neumann there. Suppose M1 and M2 be closed subspaces in the Hilbert space X. Then for each X belonging to our space, well, let's see, I can find the projection on the M1 intersect M2. Well, by, by doing these, this alternate projection things over and over again. When I say this to the nth power, it means we do this n, n times. So we would project X on the M1, project that on the M2, go back and project that on the M1, project that on the M2, and so you do that, do that in, in cycle. Those are often called von Neumann alternated projections for obvious reasons. We're projecting projections and we're alternating. Uh, I would have thought that von Neumann would have generalized to more than just two steps, but apparently he didn't because the Halpern in 62 generalized to R closed subspaces. That is, it's the same idea, but now we have R subspaces, and so we'll do. But well, we'll run through the projections starting with M1 through M2, okay, up through the R subspace, and then go back and do it over again, n times. If we, if, and if we do that, then the, the limit of this n goes to infinity, but we need a projection onto the intersection of all R subspaces. So it's just like the case up here, except now we can generalize it. Problem kind of is that. Subspaces are very special steps. There aren't very many subspaces compared to the number of closed convex sets. We'd like to be able to do it in more generality. The fact that this works is not too surprising me to go to R2. In that case, what are subspaces look like? Well, they look like straight lines from the origin. So something like that. Do the alternated projections here. I start with X. I project on the M1, that would be up to that point. Project that down to M2, that go there. Back to M1, back to M2, and see what's going to happen there. I'll walk it back down to the, to the origin there. And of course, the origin in this case would be what the, what the, the <coughs> on the, would be the projection of X on the M1 intersection. M2. You can see why it works in this case. For higher dimensions, it's a good deal more complicated than subspaces. Hmm. Maybe von Neumann's theorem works for general closed convex sets. Okay. Uh, could be, that'd be nice. It turns out it's not true. It doesn't work. Here's a counterexample. C1, and that's going to be this, this wedge that comes down here to the origin and then goes back up to 45 degrees. One, that's a closed convex set. Uh, C2, that's going to be the straight line here through through the at the height, height of one there across there. That's going to be a closed convex set. The intersection is going to be the line that goes from the zero one up here to one one. That would be the intersection. Let's take as our x, point one minus one, point down here. If I project it onto C1 first, well, let's see, that one down here is origin. Then I project that onto C2, that'll take me up to there. That's in the intersection of both sets, so if I keep projecting, I'm going to stay right there. I won't go anyplace. However, the, the actual projection from this point right here is going to be that point right there, because it's the closest to the intersection of those two. So, in that case, the one of the ultimate projections clearly doesn't.
Now, what you, what, what you really think should happen is, is that the higher the, the, the student's grade point, the better they should do in the first year of college. And the better the age you teach for, the better they should do in the first year of college. Uh, anyway, what that sort of amounts to is, 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 is you can get these projections on the major cities with increasing roads and increasing costs. Finding a projection onto an is going to a, you know, onto an increasing road for a, a number of points is well known. We, we know how to do that. So finding, finding any, so projecting on the increasing road is pretty easy. Projecting on the increasing cost is pretty easy. Projecting on the intersection, you know, is a good deal more difficult. We're doing it with cones, not subspaces, so we can't try to be very much. Didn't know. Uh, like I say, I didn't know von Neumann's scheme at the time, but I developed my own procedure for doing that. It's something called Dijkstra's algorithm. <laughs> now, uh, there's a problem here <laughs> with what, what John said earlier. Okay. Uh, there's another Dijkstra out there. He was an actual Dutchman. Kind of Dutch, but he, was, he, he, he didn't know. Esther was his machine. He did the work in 1956 and he published it in 1959. Basically, it has to do with, uh, with sort of looking at graphs and finding, and finding near, finding short. Uh, anyway, it has to do with graphs. This is the same problem. Uh, unfortunately, the page that's on people on the TV show numbers wasn't the right doctor. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate the effort to be great, but it was the wrong guy's time. Spell Spell good. Actually, maybe not good, because it, it, actually, it, uh, an old family Bible of, of my grandparents, there's, you know, that has a birthday, each and death, and that, and they, they had, actually, with a D.I.J. here, so I kind of suspect that maybe when they came over to this country, they changed the spelling of the name. But I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, okay. Uh, when I when I thought about this problem for Tim there, I, I initially considered cones, cones, because we were looking at ordering those problems. Uh, I, I wrote a paper paper on how to do it. You need to talk to the doctor. I didn't I didn't think that somebody else did. Uh, uh, anyway, I I had. I had Written up a procedure for doing that and sent it off to the guest, and I received an acceptance letter. They accepted the paper. That was great. I got the letter just before Christmas break, I remember. Uh, I thought, well, I'll put it over, you know, clean it up a little bit and send it back right away because I could use the guest in the publication. Uh, <laughs> and I read through it carefully, and I just and I discovered that there was a subtle error in it. You know what I had Grab Reed had caught it. And I thought maybe I ought to just send it back there. Which is <laughs> <laughs> I thought about the deal with, with, with Dan Brooks. You know, and, and maybe I better maybe I better not send it something to that new head there. So I remember remember that justification there. I worked really hard. Came in too early, went home late, and really, really worried about it. I mean, really worked over it. And I, and I finally figured out, you know, a way to take care of it and send it back. Got the paper published, and that was 1983, and I felt pretty really good about it. Now, in 19, 1982, when I came back from Missouri, I brought a graduate student with me here. Uh, he, he, uh, I, I'd been here in 80, we went back to Missouri in 81, and then came back here in 82. In 81, he, this graduate student, his name was James Boyle, had asked to work with me. Uh, he was an older, older student. I don't know how old he was, but he was older than he was probably in his third He had taught the Naval Academy for a while. He was, he was a pretty good mathematician, and he, 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 he offered to come back to, to, to move, well, to come to Iowa City here and work with me, and then we would go back to, back to Missouri for the final exams and get his degree from Missouri. He was a pretty, he was a pretty good student. Anyway, we, about this problem and figured out how to do it for the general case. 
the notches closed convex cones with convex with closed convex sets and anything to make it work. Uh, anyway, the, the book by the book by Deutsch is got a proof of the theorem in there. He, he calls it the Boyle Dyke.
C2 is going to be the closed half space where x1 is bigger than 0. So that'll be the point right there. The intersection is going to be this step right here. I'll start with my starting point in this case to be minus 1, 2. And I want to project onto this region right here. And what's the projection?
alpha is in a between 0 and pi over 2, whose cosine, the n, is equal to this quantity right here. So sort the of suit to the absolute value of the inner product over certain regions. So the angle between subspaces is really the arc cosine of this term right here, the alpha group. This thing is between 0 and 1. That's going to be 1 4. Uh, uh, so, so in the case of two subspaces, uh, let's put the number first. For the angle for, for two subspaces, uh, for every x, the norm, the norm here is bounded above by this quantity, which is bounded above by c here, my, 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 not the angle, but, but the cosine angle, of, to the power of 2 over n minus 1 times the value of x. So, so for every x, that, that upper bound holds, and that tells us the rate at which our alternative projection converges. Turns out this is a, this, this is actually the smallest bound. This still works for all x. So it's sort of optimal. You can extend you can extend that to the case where you've got R subspaces. Uh, you have to find you have to find a, well the cosine of the angle between every mi and then, and then the rest of the rest of your subspaces. Yeah. Um, find the bound in that case too. Well, it would be really nice if we could find a rate of convergence for the Dijkstra's algorithm. I issue that as an open challenge. <laughs> 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 but, that, but, but I don't think it's an easy problem. Anyway, with that said, I think I'll call it a day. Get ready to go out.